Shabbat Shalom, everyone. I'm Ryan White of Rooted in Torah Ministries. This week we are in the Torah portion Tetzaveh, which is 20, uh, Exodus 27, verse 20 through 30, verse 10. And uh, we're going to specifically be looking at the consecration of the priesthood. And there's a lot of great information here, so let's start off by blessing our Creator and then jump right in to our Torah portion. And it reads, Barku et Adonai Hamvarak, Baruch Adonai Hamvarak Lilam Vaed, Baruch et Adonai Rohinu Melaka Ulam, Asher Bacharbanu Mikol Hamim Venatan Lano et Torato, Baruch et Adonai Noten Ha Torah. Amen and Amen. All right, so the consecration of the priesthood is, is one of my favorite uh, things to look at because it, it starts to really give us an understanding of the sacrificial system. It's really interesting because, uh, you know, kind of the ordering of the Torah, right? You go Exodus and then Leviticus. It's, it's interesting because we're reading about things in Exodus that were like, they don't really explain until you get to the next book, and into Leviticus. It talks about offering up a sin sacrifice. Well, you don't get the instructions for the sin sacrifice until you get to Leviticus, right? So, obviously, the, the, the concept here, the, the expectation is that, you're, that Leviticus is going to inform you of, of what's going on in, in Exodus, right? Uh, we don't, when we read through the Bible, we don't necessarily need to read like this, you know, the book of Exodus happened, and then between the book of Exodus and between the book of Numbers, the book of Leviticus happened, right? That's, that's not uh, necessarily how the order of, of events goes, uh, because clearly they, they need to understand these things, right? So before you can, you know, we, we've got to the building of the tabernacle, but before you can actually start offering uh, sacrifices, uh, offerings, and stuff, you have to consecrate and initiate the priesthood, which means you have to raise, to elevate their level of kedusha or holiness. All right, kedusha is, is not actually a word found in the Bible. It's based on the word kadosh, which is found in the Bible. Uh, kedusha is, is, speaks about a, a holiness level. Right? And nowhere do we actually find holiness levels described. This is one of these things that they clearly understood, and so there was no need to explain it to them. But we see it playing out, the different levels of holiness and cleanliness, especially as, as we go through these chapters, and especially like in the, the, the purification of the leper, which the purification of the leper is tied to the consecration of the priesthood, by the way, because in both scenarios they put the blood on the ear, the thumb, and the toe of the, the right side of their body. Right? You see the parallel there. So we've got to understand, when you look at the purification of the leper, right, he does rituals on day one, and it says, and he shall be clean. But he can't go into his house. So now he can come into the camp for seven days, and then he does another ritual, and then he's clean. But then he can't go to the tabernacle. And then on the next, next day he goes and he does more rituals, and then he can finally go into the tabernacle. So obviously he had a severe level of impurity in each of these days that stuff is done. He's reducing his level of impurity, or kind of going up, right? Um, and so, we, we, you know, it's, it's kind of an unspoken, when you read the text, you kind of figure out what's going on when you really study it out. And that's what's going on here, is that when you approach the presence of God, you have to approach it in the proper state, right? You have to approach it in a level of ritual purity. And so this is why, for example, a woman during her monthly cycle, a man who had a, a nocturnal discharge, a leper, various things that are in a, a state of ritual impurity, they are forbidden from coming to the tabernacle. Not because you necessarily did something wrong, right? There's nothing wrong with giving birth, but because this is a dangerous time, for example, with, with a woman giving birth, because this is a dangerous time and, and it's very possible she could die and there's the, the loss of blood through flow, uh, you know, the, the blood flowing out. Uh, this is a time where you're, it's not that God doesn't love you. It's not that, that you're somehow sinful during this time. It's simply that because God's presence is dwelling on earth and, and the loss of blood is symbolic of our mortality, that sort of thing has to be separated out away from 
the temple worship. I hope that makes sense to you. It's, there's, it's not like you did something morally wrong. It's just a separation of the two. And that's one of the key things. With the priesthood, the priesthood is called not to be always in a ritual state of cleanliness, not to always be holy, but to make a distinction between holy and profane or common, and to make a distinction between clean and unclean. Not that you, you don't ever go into these categories, just that you've got to make that clear distinction and, and you separate these things out when you're coming into the tabernacle. So the people who are going to be working at the tabernacle, they need their family, their whole family, because remember, from this point onward, it's only Aaron and his family who, who can actually function as priests in the tabernacle service. So they have to be, as a family, separated out and, and consecrated, raised their level of holiness. Now this is interesting because they're using sacrifices and blood and, and connecting to the altar. And we actually saw this, and we, in this, in this series, we didn't get a chance to discuss it. I told you we were going to go back to it. So I want to do this really quickly now. Is let's go back to Exodus 24. Okay, Exodus 24 verse 3, it says that Moses came and recounted to the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances. So he's, he's explaining the terms of the covenant. And the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. They accept the terms of the covenant. And so Moses wrote down all the words. He built an altar at the foot of the mountain, right? And then he sends out men, young men of the sons of Israel and they offer burnt sacrifices and sacrifice bowls of peace offerings, right? At this point in time, the priesthood is not consecrated, and so he just chooses young men to do this burnt offering and a peace offering. You notice they don't do a sin offering because a sin offering is specifically tied to the tabernacle. You don't see a sin offering ever offered except when the tabernacle is standing, okay? Moses took half of the blood and put it in the basins, and the other half he sprinkled on the altar, he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people, and they said, all the word, all that the Lord has spoken will be able to do. And so Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all of these words. And then him and, and Aaron and his two sons and the 70 elders, they all go up and have a covenant meal. Okay, so what's going on here? He takes the blood of these sacrifices... And he mixes it together. The burnt offerings, right? The whole burnt offerings, the entire thing is burnt. Whereas the peace offerings, part of it's burnt. And the other part is going to be eaten by Moses, the Aaron, and his sons, and the 70 elders, right? They're going to actually eat the meat that they took the blood. And half the blood, they put it on the altar. And the other half that they put on the, the, uh, the, uh, the people. Here he sprinkles it on the people. And he only, he only does this once in history. And to really understand that there's two really good books... The first one is called Blood Expiation in Hittite and Biblical Ritual by Yitzhak Feder. And the, the other one I'd recommend is Blood Ritual in the Hebrew Bible, Meaning and Power by William Gilders. Uh, these are excellent, excellent books. Very heavy scholarly, but excellent books if you really want to get in and understand the purpose and the function of blood. And, and especially this one, uh, Blood Expiation. He uses the term what's called blood manipulation, which means taking blood of a sacrificed animal and, and manipulating it, i.e. doing something special with it. Right? If it's not a sacrifice, God says you pour its blood out on the earth and you cover it up. Right? But if you take something and you do something special with it, now it is a sacrifice, and that's what you do with it is called blood manipulation. And the blood manipulation is, is a, a ritual way of, of showing something going on, something more powerful than just words can express. We talked about this the other week with, uh, you know, talking about how you can either tell your wife you love her or you can, like, buy her flowers and chocolates and give her a massage and do all these great and wonderful things. That's going to, to, to convey the message of I love you so much more than just saying it. Right, and so the, the words of we, all the Lord has spoken, we will obey and do in the covenant is backed up by ritual action. So what does the blood do? Why the blood? When we study this out, in the, and the, these, these books, what they do is they study all the biblical texts that talk about the usage of blood, and they also study, uh, you know, this one is, is 
focused a lot in the Bible, but it also uses some contrast from other nations. This one is contrasting the Hittites. The Hittites' usage of blood is the most similar to the Israelite usage. And, and why is this important? Because when we read the text, we see that clearly the people understood the meaning of these things. God didn't have to explain, this is why we're using the blood. Right? They just understood it because they lived in that culture. And the Hittites, we've got to understand the Hittites were very influential in this time period. And so this study that compares blood expiation in Hittite and biblical ritual really helps us better understand. And of course, you know, we're not going to, to say, well, the Hittite text overrules the biblical text. This is all used to better understand what's actually in the Bible, not to replace it. I hope that makes sense. We're not, not going to something different and just bringing in pagan ideas. We're, we're using cultural concepts to understand what's going on in the Bible. And hopefully if, you, if you've been studying with me, you kind of understand what I, how I do it, right? This, is, this isn't just uh, paganizing the Bible, right? Okay, so why did they use the blood? What is the blood doing? The blood creates what's called blood covenant. And I, I forgot to bring it over here. I've got a book called Blood Covenant by... <laughs> Oh, man, I wish I would have thought to bring this. I can't think of the name of the book, and I can't see it here. Uh, Trumbull. There we go. It's at the bottom. Uh, um, it's called Blood Covenant by Henry Clay Trumbull. You can actually get this book on, in PDF form for free. It's, it's, it's an older book, so it's actually free online now. And that book tells you the importance of blood covenants. This is a guy who spent like his entire life studying covenants in, in, uh, you know, in, in uh, primitive cultures and stuff like this. And so the idea there is that blood creates a connection. The, the exchange of blood creates a connection so powerful, it's as if the two become one, okay? So by sprinkling the blood on the altar, or, or you know, putting it, splashing it on the altar and sprinkling it on the people, the altar is consecrated and the people are connected to the altar. Now, why the altar? Why not God? Because God's invisible, right? You're not going to go sprinkle blood on God. Uh, so the altar represents God and it represents his authority on the earth. Okay? So now the people, by sprinkling blood on the altar and on the people, the nation of Israel forever after is connected to God via the altar. Okay? This is extremely important. This is why when an Israelite sins after this event and when there is an altar standing, they have to bring a sin sacrifice. And what do they do with the sin sacrifice? They take some of the blood and they wipe it on the horns of the altar. The idea, and it's, it's called to expiate or to purge. The word is kippur. And now traditionally you've been taught that the word kippur means uh, to cover. That's incorrect that, that is is based on poor or, or not poor but old scholarship that thought it was related to an arabic word uh, it is the arabic word is kafara the actuality is is it's related to an akkadian word which is kupuru kupuru and jacob milgram has done a lot of fantastic work to show this uh, you can check out his his international commentary Continental Commentary, and he, he just does an ex, a, a great job. And I'm, I'm not going to repeat it here because we'd be here for three hours. But the, the idea with the way that blood is used is it's used to cleanse the altar. You can actually see that in Ezekiel chapter 43, in fact. So maybe we should go there uh, because I am introducing something kind of interesting here. Uh, but when, when we look at the altar, uh, let's see here, Ezekiel 43... Ah, here we go. Okay. Ezekiel, turn with me to Ezekiel 43, verse 19. I'm going to show this to you, okay? You shall give the Levitical priests who are of the offspring of Sadok, who draw near to me and minister to me, declares the Lord God, a young bull for a sin offering. So we're talking about a sin offering, right? You shall take some of the blood, some of its blood, and put it on the horns and on the four corners, on the ledge, on the border all around it. Thus you shall cleanse it, not the person, you shall cleanse it, and make atonement for it. So putting blood on the horns of the altar cleanses the altar. The idea is you committed a sin, that sin creates an impurity on the altar. Why? Because we just read in Exodus 24 
that the people are connected to the altar. So when the people sin, it contaminates the altar, and therefore God is saying, I'm going to forgive you of your sin, but come and clean up the mess that you made on my altar. Right? Does that make sense to you? So that's what Kippur is about. It's about cleaning up the mess that you made there. Okay, so that's why that's why it's so important to understand the, the altar to the people connection made here in Exodus 24. Okay, so with that in mind, now we're going to understand better what's going on with the priesthood because the, the, the people have been connected to the altar, but now the priesthood above and beyond have to be connected at a higher holiness level because from this point onward, their, the altar is their exclusive domain outside of obviously God's domain, right? They're the exclusive people invited to the altar. No one has permission to come to the altar outside of the priests now, right? If you notice when you look at the animal sacrifices and, and you see this even in First or Second Chronicles when it talks about that, that they were making this kind of like this restoration Passover they hadn't done in a long time. And, you know, not all the people were clean, were ritually clean. So sometimes the priests would slaughter the, the, or they said the Levites would slaughter the animal for the people, or the priest would. But if the person was ritually clean, they could slaughter their own animal. But in either case, neither the Levite nor the, the average Israelite could catch the blood. Only the priest, they'd have a special, uh, like kind of, kind of a cone-shaped uh, vessel that they would catch the blood in and they would s kind of swirl it to make sure it didn't coagulate. And so they're the only ones who are allowed to catch the blood and then they go, only a priest, you can slaughter your own animal according to the instructions, but only a priest can capture the blood and take the blood and wipe it on the horns of the altar or splash it on the corners of the altar or, or sprinkle it or anything like that. That is their right exclusively, and this is what we see going on here, is their induction and initiation into the ability to do that. So we're now going to get into our Torah portion. <laughs> okay, it's only been 17 minutes. Uh, you know, we're, we're over halfway done, but we're now we're going to get into the, the, this, and hopefully this will kind of go fast now that we've understood the basics going on here. So, uh, God tells, and we're in Exodus 29, by the way, God tells them, hey, gather up the stuff that we're going to be using here, and you shall bring, speaking to Moses, Moses will bring Aaron and his sons to the doorway of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. So this is removing the first level of impurity. And you take their garments and you put these special garments on them. These garments, the change of garments is used in the ancient world. They didn't, it's not like they had different clothes to wear every day. Giving someone new garments meant giving them a new position, a new role. All right, the, you see this with like the prodigal son, he gets a new uh, thing, the Joseph gets a special coat, the priest gets new garments, and so when he's wearing these garments, he's within this, this different role. And so him and his sons put on the garments, and then we get to the stuff that I enjoy, the sacrifices, okay? So the first one, you bring a bull to the tent of meeting, and Aaron and his sons lay their hands on the head of the bull, and you slaughter the bull before the Lord at the door of the tent of meeting. And you put the blood of the bull, or you take the blood of the bull, and you put the horns on the altar. So what type of sacrifice is this? Pop quiz, what type of sacrifice is this? Don't cheat. If you've read Leviticus, you should know this. What type of sacrifice is this? This is a sin sacrifice. Only the sin sacrifice has the blood put on the horns of the altar. Okay? Now, did they commit a sin? No. This is not, the sin sacrifice is not always offered for committing sins. The sin sacrifice is also offered for a woman who uh, has given birth to a child. Is that a sin? No. We covered that uh, coming up here in, in that Torah portion. Uh, the, the leper, did he commit a sin? No. Uh, ritual impurity. So the idea of the sin sacrifice isn't necessarily that you committed a sin, it's that you brought impurity onto the altar. And impurity can either be moral impurity brought by sins or ritual impurity due to states of uncleanliness. Uh, one of the best examples is the Nazarite. He has to bring a sin sacrifice if he's sitting on a park bench and the guy next to him falls over dead. He didn't do anything. The guy just fell over dead. Now he's got to bring a sin sacrifice. Why? Not because he sinned, but because it's cleansing the altar because of this. So Aaron and his sons, they are cleansing the altar, not just for themselves, but they're representing the people. So they're, they're basically initiating the altar. They're doing the initial cleaning of the altar here with this. And so they, they then take, and then you can see here in verse 14, you can see I was correct. 
that take the flesh of the bull and its hide and its refuse, and you shall burn them with fire outside the camp. Why? Why don't they eat them? Because it's an offering for them or for the people. Only for an individual do the priests eat the meat of the sin offering. So then they take one ram, and they lay their hands on the head of the ram, and you slaughter the ram. Now you notice there it never says they confess their sins. Why not? Because they don't confess their sins. This, the, the idea of confessing your sins over the head of the animal only happens on Yom Kippur. The, the, the normal sin sacrifice, you don't actually confess your sins over it according to the Torah, according to the text. Uh, this is something that was added in kind of later on, and it's something that we've kind of put into the text that's not actually there. It's, it's important to, to read the text, what's there and what's not there, because sometimes what's not there is equally important, right? There's a reason why they're doing these things. You notice that they never say anything. Why? Why, don't they, why aren't they chanting something while they kill the animal? Because that's what the pagans did. That's how they worshipped their gods, was through chanting and, and stuff like that. And that's, that's what magic was, and incantations. God separates all that stuff out. He, this is a silent service, essentially. They're not chanting anything. They're not doing things that, that will look like incantations. That's what the pagans did. Okay? Does that make sense to you? Okay, so this, they, they take this ram, they cut it into pieces... Uh, you offer the whole ram up on the ur on the altar. It is a burnt offering to the Lord, a soothing aroma. Okay, so there's our burnt offering. Okay, so they all just offered a burnt offering. A burnt offering is for consecration. It's for elevation. And what's going on here, by the way, what's going on here the, the entire time is what's called a rites of passage. I actually have a whole teaching. It's called the rites of passage. Uh, hopefully you can check that out. It's on rootedintorah.com. And, and basically what it is is this. Is any time you're going to from one state to a, new, to a different state, and I should have put this in here, but we're, we're going to put here old state and I'm going to come over here. Look at this. I'm doing editing on my PowerPoint. I'm not supposed to do this while I'm recording. <laughs> All right, old state and new state. So the old state was they were just average Israelites. The new state is they're going to be priests, right? So they do rites of separation. They're in a marginal state with elevated holiness and then rites of aggregation where they go into their new status. Now, this is something that's really interesting because a lot of us have gone through things like this. Rites of passage are, are things that, that continue on to this day. Uh, I, I did this when I joined the, the military. Uh, my, my old state was I was a civilian. I went to boot camp. What's the first thing that happened? During boot camp, I, had, I underwent the first day the rites of separation. They shave my hair, they, they steal my clothes, and they start yelling at me, telling me that you know, I'm nobody. I, they're breaking down who I was. And so during that time, I'm in a marginal state. In, in, in a sense, I'm in an elevated holiness. I'm in an elevated set. Remember that the holiness, holiness doesn't mean uh, that you're, you're righteous, it means that you're set apart for a special function, right? And in a boot camp, I mean, you're just, like, that's all you do. You're, you're just, you're, you're only Navy or, or whatever, I, you know, I was Navy. You're only doing that, you're, you're in this heightened, you know, I was doing stuff that I didn't do the rest of my career in the Navy. But I'm learning how to, how to, to function in my new status. And at the end of boot camp, what do they do? They do, they do testing, and then ultimately they do a graduation. And, and once I've gone through that ceremony, I'm officially a fully fledged member of the United States Navy, and I'm, you know, now I'm qualified to chip paint on a warship, right? Uh, those of you who've been in the Navy know what I'm talking about. <laughs> But during that marginal time, I was learning my role, and I was still in the Navy. I was still a United States sailor during that time period. I was still getting a paycheck, but I wasn't fully, you know, if I would have gone up to, to someone else and they'd been like, hey, I'm just as much in the Navy as you, or they'd be, say, shut up, you're, you know, you're just a recruit. You're just, uh, you're just in boot camp. Right, and you know, so you kind of see this this parallel. And there's there's countless examples. I give a bunch in my teaching, uh, but we just don't have time for that. So let's move on here. So that's what's going on. This is these these sacrifices that are being offered here are these rites of separation that they are undergoing. And so during this rite of separation, they slaughter a second ram. Now it doesn't actually call it an asham or guilt offering here, but if you read carefully, you're going to notice that this. 
they do with the same ram what they do with the ram during the the uh, the ritual of the purification of the leper. And in that ritual, it's called an asham or a guilt offering. And when we look at what they're actually doing, how they actually eat the meat later on, that shows us that this is indeed a a sham offering, more, more than likely. And the usage of a ram also gives it away. So the, they slaughter a ram and they take some of the blood and they put it on Aaron's right ear and on the ear lobes of his son's right ears and on the thumb of their right hands and on the big toes of their right foot. And, and look at the next line here. This is important. And sprinkle the rest of the blood around the altar. And then after that, they sprinkle oil. By the way, sprinkling of oil, oil is used to elevate status. But this blood being put here is ritually connecting them to the altar. This is why afterwards, only they can manipulate blood on the altar, can sprinkle blood or white blood or whatever. Right? It's connecting them back to the altar. So they have exclusive rights. So anyone who tells you that, oh, I'm a priest, now I can officiate. No, you can't. You ha only the sons of Aaron from this point in time onward. Right. Now, along with this, we, we see that there's this parallel between this and the purification of the leper. Right? Why the leper? He gets, now he gets blood on his ear and his thumb. Why is that? Because if, if we understand that, and we don't have time to go into it, but a leper was as if he was dead. He looked like a corpse. And so he's cut off from the community, sent away from the community. Now he's being brought back into the community. He's being given new life, and he now has to be reconnected to the altar because he was cut off from the altar before. Does that make sense? Right? And so all of this happens uh, to, to uh, Aaron and his sons, and they have the blood put on them. Now they're connected to the altar. They go through the, the various rituals here. And we get to verse, where's the next verse I want to look at? Verse 30, okay? Exodus 29, verse 30. For seven days one of his sons, who is priest in his stead, shall put them on when he enters the tent of meeting, speaking about the holy garments of Aaron. So this is where we see this idea of the rites of passage. They're in the seven, and oftentimes it's rites of passage. In the Bible, you're going to see a seven-day time period. Same thing with the purification of the leper. We've got here, uh, various things are, are tied in with this consecration of seven days. By the way, the, the heavens and the earth are created in seven days. And so you, you see these, these connections with these old state versus new state and the, the concept of seven days. And so we see here that uh, it says in verse 31, they take the ram of ordination, boil it, has Aaron and his sons shall eat the flesh of it. This is why I'm proposing to you that this is the Asham offering, because that's what the priests do, is they eat the Asham, or the guilt offering. I sometimes I use the Hebrew words, sorry, I do apologize. Um, and it says, for seven days you shall make atonement for the altar. Look at this, look at this. You shall make atonement for the altar and consecrate it. And the altar shall be most holy, and whatever touches the altar shall be holy. Okay? So right there we see this atonement's not being made for people. It's, the atonement is being made for the altar. And it's going to be important when we get into Leviticus, the first Torah portion of Leviticus, because you're going to see the same thing in the sin offering. It's being used to, to make atonement for the altar on behalf of the person, if that makes sense. All right, we have run out of time here. Uh, let's finish by blessing our Creator. He's blessed us. Amen and amen. All right, may God bless you and keep you. We'll see you again next week. Shalom, everyone.